Welcome to a brand new decade. 2009 was a gigantic year on Nick.com, with Workin' Man and This Is Pop releasing a game every week for Spongebob's 10th anniversary, Sarbakin releasing some of its biggest games yet, and Smashing Ideas giving us the masterpiece of Poop Deck Drawdown, Spongebob Flash games were at their highest point. Not to mention MP Game Studio ending the year on a high note with Jingle Brawl, a highly advertised crossover. So moving into 2010, things were about to get a whole lot bigger. So let's dive right into it. To start, let's look at a popular game Workin' Man put out this year. It's called SpongeBob SquarePants Bodo- <gasps> On second thought, let's not start with that one. How about SpongeBob's Jellyfishin' Mission? Yeah, that's a good one. So on April 22nd, we were given the episode SpongeBob's Last Stand. Though it came out on DVD on March 16th. It was a big special where Spongebob attempted to save jellyfish fields from Plankton's highway construction. In association with Nickelodeon's Big Green Help event, the episode received an adaptation on Nick.com. According to Flashpoint, it was made by Sarbakin, but it's certainly different from anything they made before it. They were really amping up their quality in recent installments, with Truth or Square and Frank and Bob's Quest being considerably big games. And this one was just as big, if not even bigger. But back when this was on Nick.com, it had a habit of only working on certain days. But let's see how it is. At the start, we're brought to a map of the world that we have to travel through. We have six stages as we make our way through Bikini Bottom. You also get scenes from the episode throughout it. But when you get into it, you might be surprised to find just how difficult it can be. You jump from one ledge to another using a net to catch jellyfish, which you then throw at more dangerous jellyfish. Or you just try to work around the dangerous ones. But that isn't as easy as it sounds. The ones with the long legs that shock you can be annoying when you have to wait for them to give you an opening, and the ones that follow you around can really ruin your day. But I like that once you throw a jellyfish, you can collect it all over again. You never run out of ammo. I also like destroying the big jellyfish and watching them burst into several smaller ones. The implied jellyfish anatomy amuses me. But the difficulty comes with the jumping sections, especially when you have to make your way past an enemy to a far-off platform. It can be hard to coordinate with all the obstacles in your way. Though I often forget I can crouch, which makes avoiding some enemies just a little easier. But I will say, I think they chose an especially difficult stage to start the game with. Because while every stage does give you a decent challenge, I had a much easier time with every other stage than I did with the first. Maybe it just takes some getting used to. Though there are some difficult sections throughout it, but once you get the hang of it, you can blast through most of them. And sometimes you have to decide if you really want that extra life or golden jellyfish collectible. Is it really worth facing the danger? There are also two Plankton boss fights where he comes at you with his giant bulldozer. You have to avoid it and reach a height where you can hit a jellyfish he shoots at you. Then you send it back to him. He does have a good bit of health though, and I also have to say, I really like how creative they got with the backgrounds in each level's design. The music is also catchy. <laughs> Wait, we aren't finished just yet. There's actually a lot more to this game beyond its surface. If you enter the code SAVE THE JELLIES, the destruction in the background is cleaned up and you get to play through regular Bikini Bottom. Not only that, but you can also control Patrick or Squidward, who have their own unique abilities. Amazing how so many features were behind this one code. You have the ability to fly as Squidward, so you can basically just go over the entire stage. The double jump in Frank and Bob's quest had a similar mechanic, though it sure is fun to do. Patrick can stomp and roll into a sonic spin dash to break through walls and scare off these weird schools of fish. With Patrick's strength and Squidward's ability to fly, these three characters could make a good Sonic Heroes team. But anyway, this game is really awesome. You can tell a lot of effort went into it, and there's so much to see and do. Every stage is an adventure to run through, though it can be glitchy at times. <laughs> And while it does take a bit of playing to get the hang of all the jumping you have to do, it can be rewarding once you get the hang of it. I like this one. But while Sarbakin was releasing this really big game, Workin' Man put out a sizable game of their own. This was Bodo, I mean Monster Island. 
Spanning from August 9th to August 13th, new minigames were unlocked for this tiny collection that would later grow into one of Nick.com's most beloved game series. The minigames included one where you ran away from a monster called Monster X, one where you rode Monster X and jumped over obstacles, one where you rode Monster Y through watery obstacles, one where you rode Monster Z up a mountain, and one where you rode a hairy crab jellyfish demon through a cave. It was a lot of fun. I also like the storyline of how you're trying to find Patrick and how he's trying to eat this one monster in the final cutscene when you reach him. This was really good, especially if you like the game format of screen scrolling while you run. Working Man also released a game based on the special The Clash of Triton. It's an incredible platformer where you have to save Bikini Bottom from Triton and his followers. Last time I reviewed this, I mentioned that his followers were stupid for fighting on behalf of a guy who's obviously trying to destroy everyone. But you know what? If humanity's taught me anything since then, I fully believe people would. So you fight through swarms of enemies, battle Triton as a boss, and gather relics that give you new abilities. And the level select screen has a very interesting feature where you can try to solve a puzzle and unlock a relic essential for beating Triton at the very end. Originally, the game told you to watch the special to find out how to unlock it. Then in later versions, Patrick appeared and solved it for you. But in the actual game, he and the others have been transformed into hideous monsters and you have to fight them as bosses. Then you turn them back to normal. The boss fights are a pain because your health doesn't regenerate when you reach them, and this especially sucks in the final fight with Triton because he's extremely hard to beat. And if you lose, you have to do the entire stage all over again. Unfortunately, the game doesn't tell you that the only way to lower his shield is to hit it with your trident at a specific angle, so it takes some strategizing to figure out. Kinda hard to strategize and experiment when you get sent back to the beginning of the stage whenever you die. But the game is really good, and worth giving a try. But aside from this in Monster Island, Orkin Man made some other things that were completely different. For one, they made a Match 3 game called Mr. Krabs Makes Sense. It's pretty easy, and the levels are supposedly infinite, but it's fun enough. About what you'd expect from a Match 3 game. But the music is wild. <laughs> By the way, have you ever worked at a job that only paid you in dollar bills? Those jobs don't make any sense. Sorry about that, let's move on. This is Coral Climb, which looks drastically different from your usual working man game. You bounce on top of Coral and try to make your way up to the orange one. Then you fly up to the next stage. But watch out for jellyfish. That's really all there is to it. It's really fun though. It's just an easy, casual game you can bounce around in. There's also an ad for Monkey Quest at the start. Remember that? Also, apparently the original game didn't have music, but it was hacked for the unused music track to be added. Give it a listen. Much better than Dead Silence. So now let's move on to August and see what else Working Man has for us. This is Kitchen Encounter, with a special emphasis on count. That's right, it's a game about counting. Wait till you find out who the lead developer was. SpongeBob is flipping Krabby Patties while Squidward watches from his window, and it's up to you to keep track of how many patties he flips. You count them, ignoring other garbage that goes flying, then guess it by typing the correct number into a calculator. Sounds easy, right? Well, that's because it is. It's really easy, actually. The later stages do get really fast, and it can be hard to keep track of the patties, but not too bad. They can even hit Squidward and give a silly animation. But this wasn't the only game of its kind. In the early 2010s, Working Man went through an interesting phase where they released a few semi-educational games. Another one was Ghostly Grammar, one where you avoided the Flying Dutchman and ran to word tiles that rhymed with another word. It's oddly fun, but really easy. What isn't easy, however, is Equation Invasion. You solve math problems by shooting jellyfish that have the answer written on them. I'm also amazed at how detailed your options for this are, despite how simple the actual game is. You can choose what type of math problems you get, then an individual difficulty level for each. Working Man really wanted you to practice your math. They reaffirmed this with Krusty Cashier, a game where you have to quickly add up a customer's order to make your way through a line. If you take too long, they get angry and it's a strike against you. 
An updated version of this would later be used as a minigame in SpongeBob's Big Adventures. But I'm not a big fan of math, and it takes me a while to hit all the buttons, so I really suck at this one. But you know what else I suck at? Ergonomics. So just to spite me, Working Man also made Typewriter. Ah, clever. SpongeBob's on his unicycle and you have to type the right keys on a keyboard to jump over your friends. You can set your difficulty level in this one too. It's okay, but it's no SpongeBob teaches typing. Or jumpstart typing for that matter. He made me so angry! So angry! So angry! So angry! But if edutainment isn't enough to make you rage, Working Man had other ideas. They also had a phase in the 2010s where they really enjoyed making rage games. For one, they released Bubble Blast, based on the episode Chum Caverns. You control Patrick on a rocket, much like one of his stages in Creature from the Krusty Krab, and you have to blast through a cave while avoiding rocks and the cave dwellers. If that sounds easy enough, let me tell you, it really isn't. This is often compared to Flappy Bird, but it actually came out long before it. But it's just as rage-inducing. Mostly because of these rocks that come up in the center of the stage that are nearly impossible to avoid. You go back to the start whenever you die, so they can really put an end to your run. It's extremely difficult and can be frustrating if you're trying to get far. But it isn't the only one of its kind. Working Man also released Gas Blast, which was mostly the same game, but with one significant change. Instead of using a rocket, you're farting through the air. <laughs> <laughs> but it smells real nice in that cave. And yeah, the rocks in the center are still the biggest obstacle. So let's take a break from Rage Games and see what else Working Man made this year. Now let's see here. So back in March, they released- Ugh! Okay, we're taking a break from Working Man. This next game wasn't actually made by any of the usual creators. Guess who published this one? Good old Addicting Games. Yeah, only one of the biggest gaming websites in the world. But this is Photo Flip Flop. It says to turn up our volume, so we better do as it says. Basically, it's a spot the difference game where you point out differences between these two images of Spongebob and Patrick. You have 30 seconds, and it's especially hard for a spot the difference game. I was having a really hard time finding any differences, even though there were only five. Still, I eventually managed to find- <coughs> Ah, this was just an advertisement for the Fred movie. Remember when that came out? Yeah, let's check back with Sarbakken. Another game they made this year was called The Ultimate Enemy Face-Off. It's somewhat of a fighting game where you build your own character, or enemy as they call it, to battle other enemies. And I know what you're thinking. Lucy, how have you made two SpongeBob fighting games videos, yet neither of them included this one? The answer is really simple, actually. That, my friends, is because... I didn't want to. Let's check it out. This is actually a Spongebob version of the Sarbakin game by the same name that was made for Danny Phantom in 2005. But to start off, you customize your character, then you get to choose from a selection of names for it. Oh yeah, look out, here comes Jaws Jonas. Darn it, Jaws Jonas, you ruined everything. But you attack an enemy, taking note of your energy, by striking either the head, the body, or the leg. You can also block these regions on yourself with an arrow key combination. I found my best strategy was just to spam the head attack. It helped me get a good balance of speed and damage. And Spongebob cheers you on at the end of every round, so that's good motivation for me. I also like how clean the animation is in this. It's very cool looking. Very different from Sarbakken's usual style, but very high quality. They were changing things up quite a lot this year, and nothing demonstrates that more than this other game they released. Let's head on over and check it out. So earlier in the year, an infamous episode called A Pal for Gary came out. It involved Spongebob getting a new pet named Puffy Fluffy. It was evil, so Gary didn't get along with it. But Spongebob was oblivious to the sheer evilness contained in this animal. So in this game, Gary's Revenge, Gary gets to kill a ton of Puffy Fluffies. You know what game this is based on? Angry Birds. Yeah, this is a Spongebob version of Angry Birds. Never thought we'd get one of those, did you? At least not officially. So you have to destroy all these puffy fluffs by throwing different shells at all the structures they're inside of. Then you watch them die in various comedic ways. You can get really clever with some of these murders, especially when different shells come into play. There's one you can slam down with, one that can get big and roll, one that can unleash a swirling gust of wind, and one that just flat out explodes. I really enjoy seeing all the different ways these accursed creatures can die. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, missed one. There we go. And what's with Gary's face here? This is the last thing a Puffy Fluff sees before it dies. So yeah, a different direction for Sarbakken, but a good one. Now there was another Gary game that I couldn't find a release date for, but it was based on an episode that came out in 2010, so I guess it wouldn't hurt to mention it. This is Gary's Crush, made by Workin' Man and based on Gary in Love. In the episode, Gary falls in love, with a snail named Mary nonetheless. In this, you're trying to reach her. You do this by bouncing off of Mary's ex-boyfriend, the mean snails, or gifts for her. These will give you a boost and help you go farther, but you have to turn yourself very quickly in the air because you can only land on the other snails with your shell and on the gifts with your body. It's a lot harder than you'd think it is. You have to be very quick about it. But the game is decent if you like this character launching format. Another romantic game that came out this year was I Love Spongebob. In this, Patrick is a game show host and the point of the show is to figure out who's in love with Spongebob. And they sure are stylish in those outfits. But you go through a couple mini-games that somehow determine who has a crush on Spongebob. And in the first one, you click the mouse button when a meter is as close to its target as you can get it to be. Then Spongebob hits this button with a hammer and sees how high he can raise the bar. Then you do a Plinko game where you drop a tiny ball down a path and try to give yourself the most points possible. Then you throw a plunger at a target Patrick is laying on, trying not to hit him. Though he'll have a plunger on him in the next cutscene regardless. Then you have to guess who your lover is. And it can be a variety of different characters. Hey look, Squid Bob is canon. You heard it here first. So this is very basic and there isn't much to see with it. But it's a cute little game that can give you a smile. It's nice enough. So now here's an interesting one. Bubble Bros is a Sarbakken game that features their usual enemy robot design. This is the second Spongebob Flash game to be heavily inspired by Bubble Bobble. The first was Who Bob What Pants, though the title may be referencing Super Mario Bros. In this, you control either Spongebob or Patrick as you fight these robots in a small platformer. You blow bubbles around them, then you burst the bubbles and destroy them. Spongebob is fast, but Patrick is the better jumper. But these enemies are really quick, so you'd better be hitting them with all you've got. The ones that jump are awful to deal with. But once you've played it for a bit, you won't have too hard of a time, though it will give you somewhat of a challenge. I also really like how everything is designed. It has a very retro feel to it, keeping with an arcade format. The animations are also lively and enjoyable to watch. This is a really good one. And for another fun fact, these robot enemies would also be used in Nick Dodgers, a collab between Spongebob and Tough Puppy that came out the same year. You could even play as them with Plankton controlling the leader. This was a game of dodgeball where you hit the other team with dodgeballs and tried to rack up a higher score. It was pretty fun. But now let's cover a game based on a really big episode that came out toward the end of the year. The Great Patty Caper, advertised as Mystery with a Twistery, was an episode that took place on a train. As such, it received its own minigame compilation where the games were all train-themed. It was called Mystery Train, which may be a reference to the popular 1950s song. But this was a collection of four minigames developed by 7-2. They were new faces on Nick.com, but they'd go on to make a few other Spongebob games. For now, let's check this one out. Enjoy the noir style with fitting background music. <laughs> You have this map with four mini-games as you try to reach the bank across the railroad. This first one is called On the Right Track. You gradually move across three rows of tracks while avoiding obstacles and blowing your whistle to scare jellyfish out of your way. For a side note, the sound of the whistle really upset my dog. She was laying next to me and would not stop barking the entire time I was playing this. So I guess something about this sound effect doesn't sit right with animals. You slow down whenever you take damage, so you really have to manage which tracks you switch to. I like how you can see the train's controls at the bottom of the screen though, and the speed you're going at. This is a fair game. The next one is Train Jumper. You have three lives and have to jump from one train car to another. Apparently these trains have a conveyor belt security system because they force you to move in one direction or the other and you have to work against the current. This is alright. Then for the third one, Break Loose the Caboose, bandits are shooting grappling hooks at you. You have the ability to shoot stars, so you have to shoot the bandits, right? Ha ha ha, wrong. You wait for the bandits to grapple onto the train, then you shoot their grappling hooks. Wouldn't it be easier to shoot them and prevent them from grappling onto the train in the first place? No? 
Come on, those stars can totally knock them off their seahorses. But the game is also alright. Lastly, we have Toss It Like It's Hot. You have to keep the train going by shoving coal into one of two furnaces. You do this by hitting the correct on-screen arrow key when a pile of coal reaches a furnace. It's simple at first, but it gets much faster as time goes by. And sometimes you have to hit two arrow keys at the same time, so it keeps you on your toes. This one's fun, and the whole game is a nice tribute to the episode. I really like the style of it and how it uses the train format in four different ways, all of which are appropriate to the theme. It's a decent compilation, and you can try each of these to see how high your score can get. 7-2 really left a good impression with this one. So I think that does it for the games I wanted to cover in this video. There were some really impressive ones, and a lot of them that seemed to be- Ahem. Um... Oh no, I am not reviewing that one. No chance I'm touching that game with a million meter pole. Nope, not gonna do it. Not a chance. Look, I really value my sanity, and I really don't want to- Okay, okay, fine, I'll look at it. So... In March of 2010, Workin' Man decided it would be fun to release their very own Rage game. It was so notoriously difficult that it actually became an internet trend for YouTubers to film themselves playing it. Bubble Blast and Gas Blast may have been hard, but they might as well have been Jumpstart Pre-K compared to this one. This is Botocross. You control Spongebob in a boat, and it's extremely accurate to how he drives in the show. Using the arrow keys, you balance the boat he's driving by leaning to the left or the right while driving at the same time. If you flip upside down, the boat explodes, Spongebob goes flying, and you start over. If you run out of lives, you go back to the very start of the game, making all your progress meaningless. You have to maneuver over obstacles, holes, and inclines, all while keeping yourself upright. This is way harder to do than you might think it is. The slightest mistake can send you spinning to your doom with no hope for recovery. It is an extremely cruelly designed experience. You might get the hang of it the first time, or even for a few times in a row, but eventually, you'll lose your momentum and struggle to do what you were once able to do flawlessly. Trying to go up obstacles can just outright capsize you, and trying to get over holes requires some expert level strategizing sometimes. You have to hit them at just the right speed to make it over but not so much that it flips you. This is also an issue when going up a hill. Again, one small mistake can absolutely destroy you. This game doesn't know the meaning of the word forgiveness. And sometimes, things like this happen. Look, I'm driving on my nose. My fate is inevitable. I can only drag it out for as long as I can until I succumb to it. Ain't that the perfect metaphor for life? And nothing hurts more than reaching a level you struggled to get to, only to die right away and lose it all. And it really doesn't help that the happy-go-lucky music in the background is taunting you the entire time. Of all Spongebob Flash games, this is easily the one I've struggled the most with. We've played some really hard ones on this channel, but this easily takes the cake. I'd even say it's harder than Operation Rail. Yeah, I went there. This game is for those who like to suffer, those who enjoy shedding tears over Spongebob computer games, those who happen to not be me. Seriously, I'm already bad at games, no need to make them even harder for me. So, before I completely lose my mind over this, I think we need to cut it. So anyway, as we can see, 2010 was a really big year. All of the companies, especially Sarbakin and Workin' Man, were putting out some of their biggest works. Workin' Man would also put out Legends of Bikini Bottom, a massive minigame compilation that we covered in an earlier video. This would keep up their trend of making really big Flash games for the show. The standards were launched going into this decade, so every company needed to give it their all. Nick.com would continue to release great games and keep the high energy going for all the years to come. This was a new era, and one that would continue to build the childhoods of children growing up with SpongeBob SquarePants. Now excuse me for a moment. 
I have to go distract myself until I forget every last second I played of Bodo Cross. Never touching a boat again. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.